Welcome to Trash Compactor. I'm Josh, and today I'm joined by Russ. Howdy. And host of our cousin podcast, The Secret Origins of Mint Condition, James. Hello. Which is an appropriate guest for this particular episode. We're going to be talking about a Star Wars comic. Travel with us, if you will, to the early mid-90s. We're going to be talking about Dark Empire, written by Tom Veach and illustrated by Cam Kennedy. It was originally released by Dark Horse Comics between December 1991 to October 1992. And two sequels, Dark Empire 2, that was released in 94-95, and the two-issue conclusion, Empire's End, at the end of 1995. This, I think is one of the two sort of cornerstones of the expanded Star Wars universe. I think in my mind, especially from the era that we all come from, it's sort of this and the Thrawn trilogy, the Heir to the Empire trilogy. I think like these are the two things that loom largest in terms of Star Wars expanded universe of that of that era. I want to start off by asking, how did you first encounter Dark Empire? What's your experience with it? Russ. So I remember it could have been Wizard Magazine. I could remember seeing ads for Dark Empire in either Wizard Magazine or some sort of other uh, like comic, uh, like trade circular kind of thing. And I remember seeing the uh, the cover and it's it's the Dave Dorman cover. So he does the cover on each of um, the six issues of Dark Empire and then Dark Empire 2. And it's Luke Skywalker uh, with uh, a red lightsaber wearing uh, Darth Vader's, uh, outfit. And like that, that caught me. I was like, what, what is this? Uh, because, uh, Dorman's known for his, you know, photorealistic kind of work, um, doing movie posters and things. And I saw that I was like this, this, I have to get a, get my hands on. And actually, I think by the time I, I realized what it was and got to the comic shop, uh, I was in the back issue bin already. And it was just a few issues of Dark Empire 2 were around. So I, I kind of read it piecemeal originally. And I think maybe it was a library or later, or it was later until I got the um, uh, trade paperback. Um, but yeah, the, I had seen it, uh, you know, advertised. And I was like, I this is Star Wars that I didn't know existed. And I need this. And James, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know this existed until, you know, to call back to my own podcast, I went into the Mint Condition, the comic book store, and episode, I mean, episode, issue five was already on the wall. It was a wall book already, so, and I think it was like going for 25 bucks, and the only issue I actually got in real time was issue six, which I think is, is Leia with her lightsaber is on the cover. Yes. I don't know if you remember that, Russ, with the, she was holding the lightsaber in the very night pose. Uh, actually, uh, is his lightsaber red or green on the cover? I don't know. I'm colorblind. I can't tell. <laughs> I think it's green. I think it's green. Yeah, so that's green. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so something our viewers might not know, guest Russ happens to be red, green, colorblind, right? Yeah, correct. Which is actually so, but that's very actually strangely uh, appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to say, like, that's kind of cool because I was like, maybe I missed a cover because, like, I don't recall Luke having the red lightsaber in the story. But that's that'd be cool cover art if that's like, you know, what they, they chose to sell, sell the series on. So this whole time I thought it was red. And so in the Vader outfit with the red lightsaber, I thought, OK, so Luke is fully uh, gone dark. And that's what this book is. And I wanted it. And I was like, this is. This is the best thing I've ever seen. Just hearing that makes me sad that that's not what it actually was. I feel like he should have a red lightsaber because spoilers abound, by the way, for everything that happens in this. <laughs> the main story conceit, or one of them, is that Luke Skywalker falls to the dark side or well, joins the dark side. Yeah. He doesn't fall. So the idea that he would have a red lightsaber on the cover makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I'm sure that would raise a lot of eyebrows. I'm surprised that they didn't go with that, actually. Yeah, actually, in the story, I mean, I don't know if we want to dive into the storytelling right away, but I, I am surprised they didn't go, he didn't go full turn with where the story went with having a red lightsaber or, you know, taking on Vader's lightsaber or something like that, because that would have been a good, aside from a great selling point, it would have also been, I think, possibly a good story point. I mean, not that I don't like, I, I do oh, enjoy, sure. the, I do enjoy the Dark Empire story as it is, but I, I'm surprised they didn't go that route. So for me, like the two of you, the first thing that I was attracted to was the cover art. The covers, I think, for, for all of the issues are really stunning. And in preparation for this, I was reading a bunch of interviews and some, some articles about the genesis of Dark Empire. And um, what's the artist's name who did the covers? Dave Dorman did the, the yeah. covers. Uh, so Dave Dorman said something where he was like, I wanted the covers to seem like they could be movie posters. 
you guys are obviously much more well-versed in comics than I am, but I recall at the time there was a level of the artwork that set it apart from what I remember what other comics generally looked like at the time in terms of the cover art. Definitely a sense that this was something special. And I, like you, Russ, I never read the original Dark Empire series until I got the trade paperback. And it's kind of a bummer because while the cover is amazing, you're missing five other awesome covers. I think that they <laughs> they do print them within the trade itself. Yeah, and there's a few versions. I mean, um, I think they exclude the covers in all of the versions. There's like a, a hardcover version that collects uh, the first two books and Empire's End. Um, I don't, I'm trying to see when that was published. 95. Yeah. The end of 95. So I was actually surprised because I looked, I think, on Wikipedia for the publication of all of these. And they're actually much closer together than my memory. Like, I assumed that Dark Empire was like 96 and Empire's End was like 97 or 98. But they were actually all pretty close. The first issue of Dark Empire was October 94 and into most of 95. And Dark Empire 2 was also in 95. And Empire's End, I believe, was also the very, very end of 1995. So so uh, I was actually surprised. I thought there was more of an in-between period in between them. Well, I think they knew Dark Horse that they had a winner, even if they didn't know they had a winner. And they planned this out because, I mean, this, this I mean, I, I again, I, I haven't read them together in a while. I mean, I read Dark Empire in preparation for this. But it, this also doesn't step on the toes of what happened in the Thrawn series. In fact, it references things that happened in the Thrawn series. And... This was like the start of, we're not going to get any c cinematic Star Wars as far as we know, but this is this is going to be the new cinematic universe or the new Star Wars universe. So I think Dark Horse and um, I forgot who was publishing the books at the time, but they were like, let's go, let's 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 re reboot the universe. <laughs> yeah. So before we get too far, um, and and I kind of want to talk about the genesis of the book. Um, so it was it was Tom Beach who was working with Cam Kennedy. And I want to say this was originally published um, by DC Comics. I'd have to check. But it's um, The Light and Darkness War, which is like a Vietnam um, kind of era or, yeah, Vietnam, like post-Vietnam era thing where you have um, um, some veteran uh, soldiers uh, who are actually um, kind of getting transported into another world. And there's very much like this kind of dark and light side mythology going on in the book. And there's high technology and old technology and portals and Nikola Tesla. Like it's, it's wild. Like it's, I, I didn't finish it, but I started reading it and it's uh, really wild. And you can see like they shop this book. I think they sent it directly to George Lucas um, to get him excited. Uh, and that's, I think what started that conversation. And from there uh, they started to talk about the book um, with Archie Goodwin at Epic comics, which was a subdivision of Marvel at the time. Um, who were, they were doing kind of more, not necessarily more adult books, but, um, you know, outside of the superhero genre. Uh, and from there it went to dark horse. Um, but based on, uh, uh, Tom Beach's writing and, uh, Cam Kennedy's art and the, the kind of the tech art that he was kind of known for doing like highly detailed, uh, ships and craft. Uh, I think that's what I guess ultimately got them, um, the deal, but they had, they had, uh, scripted and drafted a dark empire before, um, Lucasfilm reached out to, uh, is it Ballantine books, um, who put out, uh, heir to the empire Bantam Bantam books. Right, yeah. right, right. Bantam books. So in preparation for this, actually the star Wars insider, they did a three part series about the, the Genesis of the dark empire comics. And I actually, um, found those issues and I read them and, uh, basically in a nutshell of uh, what you, uh, what you said is right. Uh, uh, Tom Veach, um, he got it in his mind. He really wanted, uh, uh, to do a Star Wars comic. He wrote a letter to Lucasfilm and he heard, uh, you know, sort of on a whim. And three days later, he got a phone call and, uh, basically they were interested. And then, um, he sent George Lucas the, um, what is it called? The Light and Darkness War? Yeah. And basically after George Lucas saw that, like on the strength of that, he was like, yeah, sounds great. And then there was a changeover at Marvel that put the brakes on the whole thing. So that was in 1988. And then I think Tom Veach had written the first three issues and Cam Kennedy had done all of the, the artwork for the first issue. 
and their champion at Marvel, whose name is escaping me, he went to DC and the new regime at Marvel wasn't really interested in Star Wars. So, so that delayed everything until eventually Dark Horse saw it and they thought it was amazing and they wanted to put it out and they were also interested in getting the license to produce more Star Wars comics in general. And that was sort of what resurrected it. But in the interim, Lucasfilm was also working with Timothy Zahn about this idea of relaunching Star Wars as a series of novels. And there was initially some concern among the two very separate creative minds at work because they were essentially covering the same territory, the aftermath of Return of the Jedi and what happened after the Battle of Endor. But uh, Tom Veach said that the solution was very simple. He was just like, okay, I'll just set this a year after the Zahn trilogy and I'll just have an opening crawl that sort of recaps what happened in that. It was really no problem. Yeah, that's the hence the birth of the expanded universe, right? <laughs> and that's that's the birth of the expanded <laughs> universe. Yeah. What's interesting is they had Tom Veach give notes to Zahn and Zahn notes to Veach about their stories. And in interviews with Tom Veach, uh, you find out that there was uh, I don't know some uh, some ruffled feathers um, in the process because they they were critical of each other's takes on Star Wars and each of their own philosophies of how they viewed Star Wars that came through in their work. So. Um, those articles are, are easily uh, Googleable out there, but definitely uh, worth checking out. No, for sure. What's really interesting was that, you know, like Zahn, he was really more in like that, like military sci-fi mode. And I didn't know this until I was reading this interview with Tom Veach in the Star Wars Insider, but he's really like more of a... um he's more of like a mystic. Like he was a monk for a while. He dropped a lot of acid in the sixties, so much so that he had to leave school and kind of take a year off and recover from all the psychedelics that he did. And then he became a monk. So it is interesting because the two approaches, both of them fit within the Star Wars universe, like the the very military sci-fi stuff, and then also the more spiritual kind of mystic side of like, you know, the force and journeys of self-discovery inward and outward and all of that, which I think is more where Veach was coming from. Um, and that I found super interesting um, because I have to confess, like both Dark Empire and the Heir to the Empire Zahn trilogy, they're not, they're not my favorite pieces of Star Wars media. They are obviously very formative because they were the beginning and they were the the things that loomed the largest in the era of fandom that we came up in in the early 90s. But um that that was really interesting to me and made me appreciate them a lot more just hearing about the different philosophies between the two writers. I mean, I guess I would like say for our generation, these are sort of our movies. I guess we were there for these things premiering. You know, we we were v, the original trilogy is VHS or had already come out. The next generation gets the prequels. The current generation gets the sequel. So we got the expanded universe. Because <laughs> that's and we were it's there. Ours. At the yeah, it's ours. Yeah, <laughs> it's ours. It's our thing. <laughs> so well, it's really interesting though that you say that because. Russ, like when you said that you saw the cover art and you were like, oh, like there's new Star Wars that I don't know about, like that was actually my experience as well. And I think that's what was so exciting to me about it, because, you know, we call this moment in the early 90s, like the dark times, because there was just no new Star Wars. So the idea that there was some piece of Star Wars that was new that I didn't know inside and out was was incredible, whatever it was. And again, just seeing the the really beautiful cover art really got me excited. Um, I do want to talk about the art within the book itself, the Cam Kennedy artwork, because, you know, again, I should say I'm not a comics guy. You two very much are. And that's why I would only be willing to have a discussion about a Star Wars comic with either one of you. And the fact that it's the two of you together, I think your combined knowledge of the medium is... Um, I'm I'm humbled to be in your presence. Stop. No, I really am. But uh, one of the things about the artwork of Dark Empire by Cam Kennedy, like like even to me, it's very clear that that this is something very special and very unique. So if you could talk a little about the style of the art. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, uh, when I was younger uh, and I first picked it up, you know, having only seen the Dorman cover, I opened it up. And I was like, what is what is this? 
what what kind of comic book is this? Most of my familiarity with comics at that point had been, you know, Marvel and DC. And my one of my earliest comic experiences was the uh, Return of the Jedi adaptation comic, um, which almost looks like a rotoscoped comic. Um, it's the great Al Williamson, but like it has very distinct, like these are translated movie stills. And then, I, and so when I first saw Dark Empire, it's like I don't, I don't think I loved it. Um, and the colors are wild. And I was just like, what? I had not seen uh, what I now know is like the 2000 AD, like UK style. Um, so Cam Kennedy, a uh, Scottish artist, uh, got his start really, uh, or is best known for some of his work on Judge Dredd, um, which I've since uh, checked out. Uh, so he just really like a detailed, uh, quick kind of uh, draftsman. Um, and I think what's interesting too in Dark Empire is that uh, he is doing all of the art himself. Uh, the, the lettering duties are uh, Todd Klein is doing the letters um, that's done later, but he's drawing, painting, I suppose, inking, maybe sometimes it's pencil, but yeah, uh, he's doing all those. So he's choosing the color palette, um, which nowadays, you know, most uh, colors, at, I said the majority of colors done digitally, but uh, he's he's essentially doing all three, the penciling, the inking, the coloring, all three major uh, aspects of comic making that traditionally in the big two, Marvel and DC would potentially be done by, you know, each job a different person. So the fact that he has this kind of authorship over uh, all of the elements, completely controlling the look of the style, he's breaking down the script that Tom Veach has wrote, deciding the camera angles. Um, I, you know, over time I've, I've fallen in love with his work and I now consider him probably one of my favorite comic artists. And I've kind of seek, uh, sought out, uh, and have been seeking all of his work wherever I can find it. Uh, very much, um, I would say, as you flip through Dark Empire, every single panel, um, maybe say for like you know a talking head panel, uh, the body posing, everything has action. All of the characters are articulated in a way that's really specifically. Uh, there's an action. There's a motion. Uh, there's one panel uh, in uh, Dark Empire when they're, um, I think they're on now Hutta, and they're going through that shoot, and. Uh, there's an explosion on a craft and a figure of the pilot is flung out of the craft. And like, I heard a Wilhelm scream in my head when I saw that panel, I was like, this is the <laughs> most like detailed, like you see the action, you kind of feel it. And to the point where like, yeah, this is really cinematic storytelling. Um, and we can contrast it later with empire's end, which cam County did not illustrate um, because I believe he, at the time he was actually, uh, doing uh, Death Lies and Treachery. I could be wrong on the timeline because he had worked for some other companies, but because his art takes so long to do, uh, it's so time consuming um, to illustrate these pages that he would be locked into a next project far, far ahead of finishing the one he's currently on. So I think that's what happened. He got scheduled. Um, there was a possibly a declining return on Dark Empire 2. And so there he got pulled on to another book um, with, I believe it was John Wagner, who he'd worked previously with on uh, Judge Dredd. Uh, for 2000 AD. So what is interesting about that, though, because as you look at Empire's End, you do get the sense that the artist is trying to, yeah, trying to mimic the style for sort of consistency, which I think says a lot that, um, you know, for me, I don't think you can separate the style of the artwork from these comics and have it work in the same way. So, so you know, like for a layman, the thing that's most striking to me about the artwork is the use of color. It's not naturalistic. It's like a few primary colors that are used to render the whole scene, like sort of uh, create a mood. So you might have like everything or reds and purples or greens and blues and yellows and stuff that that creates a mood. It's not very naturalistic. It's very stylized. And the other thing that I think is very interesting, and again, I don't know how common or uncommon this is. It, it seems to me that it is more uncommon, but the use of watercolor. Yeah, no, it was not used a lot. I mean, to my knowledge at that time and um... It definitely like the colors, the tone and the style of the art is it's it's creating a tone. It's creating an emotional tone through how he chooses to depict the characters, the colors he's he's doing. Also, being a one man show is is takes so much time. Like as as Russ was saying, like comics are usually there's the penciler, the inker, the colorist, the letterer. Like the fact that, you know, being a one man show, doing your pencils, your inks and your colors, it takes forever. It's amazing that that he did it. 
Um, and the choices that he made were, you know, you talked about in the past, Josh, about having this, um, this grittiness being lost in Star Wars recently. I mean, the comic has that hands-on sort of made-by-people mm -hmm. look that the film, the yes. original trilogy, had to it. So, yeah, I think, I mean, he's achieving a lot of stuff through the artwork. And it's, I would say for Russ, you know, what Russ said is also true for me. When I first saw the book, the cover got me, but the inside artwork didn't quite jive with me yet, um, you know, or connect with me. It took a little bit of time, but... Now, when going back, especially rereading it now, it definitely connects with me. Uh, he he reminds me very much in, in different ways to a Tim Sale or a David Mack, who are people who are very stylized, but their style is to convey emotion and action and not realism. You know, because we, we already have the realism, I think, of these characters in our head. So you can do a lot more on the page now. Because the, the, I mean, Luke Skywalker is Mark Hamill. I mean, you can draw him any way you want. He was Mark Hamill. But what you do with the colors and how you, you know, Pose, pose him and and what expression you give him, it gives more impact to whatever's going on in that particular panel. And on that about the um, kind of likenesses, there, there was an interview uh, that I was reading where, uh, you know, some people had complained early on about the likenesses. Like, this doesn't look like Mark Hamill. And Cam Kennedy was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to take some license here. Like, this is a visual medium. Comics are their own medium. That's the movie. You know the character. I'm going to interpret this character in a way that I can repeat because otherwise you're almost, you know, you're drawing a frame for a movie, but a way that I can repeat and I can give it kind of a second life, a different life that, you know, is mine to control. So as a creative artist, um, I feel like, you know, he had to kind of get some authorship over that character uh, that he was creating. I mean, yeah, because also who knows if there was going to be any more Star Wars with Luke Skywalker. So it's sort of like, this is like the continuing adventures of Luke Skywalker and Mark Hamill will always be a Luke Skywalker, but we're now we're taking him new places and we're going to go places that that Luke Skywalker never went before. So he can be his own thing. And, and then he can be many things to many other artists who obviously are going to draw him, you know, and still draw him. But in the expanded universe, he's going to become a different person than we saw on screen. And James, back to your point on the kind of the kind of grime, uh, I think for me, that's kind of the thing that I love now, um, because Star Wars, in a way, seems like it's clean, dirty. Um, like, you know, the new Star Wars we're getting, it's like, it's made to look dirty, but it feels like clean, dirty. Like I kind of needed to actually be grimy. Like it needs to be messy. And, and Cam Kennedy was drawing Judge Dredd, which takes place in mega city in, in a future time. Uh, and it's, a t it's, it can be grungy. It can be grimy. And he draws tech in a certain way. And I feel like the representation of his tech in dark empire to me feels like an evolution for Star Wars. It's possibly dirtier. Um, it's possibly grungier and also the, at the time you're, you're coming right on the heels or at the same time as like cyberpunk. Um, and I feel like star Wars was always kind of was cyberpunk, but not quite. And Jedi is getting closer to it in my mind. And I feel like this is the next evolution of a visual style where I feel like this is way more cyberpunk, way more techie. There's like a big blade runner kind of advertising view screen, um, at one point. Um, and it could be the colors too, like a little bit of that neon color, but I feel like a lot of that, um, that thought process, I'm like, oh, this is star Wars. This is pushing star Wars further than it was. Like it's doing what star Wars always did in every movie. It evolved visually, cinematically, you know, in the effects department. And I feel like for comics, this is doing, uh, for star Wars and comics, what the movies had done every time and kind of evolved and kind of create a new visual look. So I felt like that was in the spirit of star Wars. It was trying to innovate on top of telling a story so that's kind of this this underlying aspect that i love about it that's actually a really good point the cyberpunk aspect i think is something you're right on the money with that hadn't occurred to me because sort of cyberpunk in terms of cinema really was like i mean arguably really started with blade runner in 82 so sort of too late to really have an effect on star wars but this is the first new star wars in a visual medium that is really existing and being created in a world where cyberpunk is omnipresent, right? So that is a really good observation, actually. Um, the other thing that I realized, like, so when I was rereading it for this, I didn't remember a lot of the actual story from when I was a kid, but, but I remembered some of the set pieces and the opening set piece of ground combat on Coruscant with the walkers and the urban warfare of it all. Like that's, you know, this is still the early 90s. Like this is still not something you could really ever see on screen. So these huge battlefields and like an urban landscape with 
these walkers and wrecks and explosions and fire and troops. This is not something that we could have seen in a movie. Like this is still five, six years away from the prequels where they could even render a clean version of this environment on screen. So it was really showing us something that we had only ever imagined and we we had never actually seen anywhere. There's a, like a level of like brutality and horror of war that you never saw in any Star Wars movie. I've not seen, I don't think, any Star Wars movie that, for that first flash fade right there. And that's the great thing about comics. You can get away with a level of violence because it's comic book violence, even though... Yeah, because it like, is, So because yeah. it's inherently stylized. On that page, um, I think it's like a few pages in, it's a two-page kind of splash uh, showing this battle. There's such minute detail of soldiers in the background, TIE fighter exploding, like on fire, like crashing in the back. There are so many, it's almost like instead of breaking it down into panels, there are panels within the actual imagery. Um, and as comics can do, they can stop time. Uh, you can look at things at different moments. And there really is a narrative on this page that you could not film. And so in a way you're looking at it, uh, it is really, it is cinematic, but it is also like comic book time cinematic. And it really, uh, Star Wars benefits from the medium of comics, whereas if you translated Dark Empire, it would just look like a movie. Uh, but in its form as a comic, it's like it's it's unparalleled. Yeah, well, that's an interesting point as well, uh, because like something I often hear from certain segments of fandom is that they just should have made Dark Empire as a movie or they should have made Heir to the Empire as a movie. But like for me, especially with Dark Empire, I don't think... Like, you would have to figure out some cinematic equivalent. Animation. Well, sure. Yeah, sure. But, like, the point of what I'm trying to say is that I don't think it's as straightforward as just make this into a live-action movie. Because, again, like, I think, you know, and I say this all the time. I've said this on other podcasts. I've said this on your podcast, James. I don't think you can separate the cinema from Star Wars, right? And this is an example where I don't think you can separate the comic medium from what this is. I think it all adds up to a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts. No, that makes sense. I mean, it's kind of in, in retrospect now, the kind of thinking you have back then, or you're like, oh, they should have just filmed Dark Empire. Dark Empire would make a great movie. The expand, like since this, this Dark Empire and the Thrawn trilogy created the cornerstone of the expanded universe, and then the expanded universe just kept evolving and became what it is. It, these are like these are all epic stories and they all have stakes but you there are also stakes within a larger universe and how would you even make a universe or movies around this like dark empire being its own movie it's it's great but is it is it the stakes that we saw in the original trilogy and, and to continue to follow that up with and turn every book and every story into a movie would be impossible you just couldn't do it you'd have to make cuts somewhere you'd have to change the story somehow so it, it's no, just not realistic sure. Well, so one of the things that they do in this comic, besides having Luke turn to the dark side, is they resurrect the Emperor, which I think they do in an interesting way. Because again, like this is before the prequels. This is before we knew anything about the Clone Wars. So something that I think we take for granted is the way that the Emperor is resurrected and as a clone using clone technology, I think is actually kind of enhancing the mystique of the Clone Wars, right? Like, like without knowing what the Clone Wars were, the idea that it's like, oh, it's this rather than, you know, something that's kind of unimaginative or something that doesn't make sense. Actually, in this context at this time, I think it actually makes a lot of sense. I think it actually works pretty well. Yeah, I think I think that's actually something that really drew me to this. And I feel like this uh, this series is actually and we can we can go into further talk about like sequel comparisons. But uh, the more Star Wars we got, the more Dark Empire gets better, like it gets better for me because of these additional ideas and uh, what happened in the prequel trilogy, uh, especially with the idea of the Clone Wars. And it's and which is really a kind of a pre like a cyberpunk idea as well. Um, kind of cloning, body modification, those kind of things that yeah. we see in Star Wars, but it's never kind of the focus. Like a cyberpunk, like the medium is the message. Like the focus is a lot of that technology, um, mm. which I could segue right into. Uh, one of the big things in Star Wars is always like, well, what is the big weapon? What is the big battle? What is What are we fighting against? Uh, I think Dark Empire starts to touch that like 
you're always fighting like they didn't like there, there is no true winner and we see it with air of the empire there's there's legions of troops out out yon like out far in like you know the far side of the galaxy um and you're, you're never really winning but there's this uh real kind of look and it happens more in dark empire too but there's a look of like uh the weapons of war the kind of uh galaxy military industrial complex and so the th one of the major mm. threats the empire brings out in this book is um the world devastators which visually are a very imposing um weapon uh, basically a machine that kind of hovers over the surface of the planet um sucking up raw materials sucking up also craft mineral whatever and basically creating on board um new uh new craft to send out to fly and fight uh new weapons of and, war yeah and i think one of the was i don't know if it's in in the, the preface or somewhere is referenced that uh these world devastators were more deadly than the death star i think it's actually in in the actual text of the comic and my first thought was no that's that's actually not a great uh description of the world devastators i think they realized when you have a death star and you know in the first uh first and third uh if you blow up a planet uh, your weapon is fear, uh, because if you blow up a planet, you've destroyed the resources and the people. Um, so you've actually lost, um, and all of you you've gained is fear. So the Death Star they tried twice, did not work. The World Devastator, instead of destroying the world and the people, you can take from it and create more weapons. So you basically you do create fear, um, but you're basically just eating eating the resources, eating the planet. It's like a different way to uh, wage a war. It's almost like scaling it down, like. Uh, from nuclear back to like a land battle uh, or or air or sky battle um, it's it's a different take and i think it's more effective because they realize the the value of uh controlling the galaxy is not to destroy it uh planet by planet or to impose fear but to take the resources um so i think i think it's kind of a a weapons improvement as far as a threat um kind of slow moving kind of hulking things that you can attack and so there's definitely more drama more cinematic moments um but they look they look cool and it's 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 a threat and it's just building out uh the empire's strength no i would agree with that yeah i mean it's also an idea that um is, has pervaded through depictions of the empire when we saw it you know in clone wars and rebels and wrote like wrote, the idea that the empire strips anything it foresees even obi-wan so this you know whether or not it started in dark empire is it's the take take on the empire that we really didn't think about in the original trilogy about what the empire actually does to all the planets that are underneath its you know its you know rule or whatever mm. the other super weapon i think i forget what they call it but it's sort of that hyperspace missile the galaxy that, gun yeah the galaxy, the galaxy gun yeah. yeah. The, um, when I reread these, I read it in the trade format. So it all sort of blurs together for me. So, but is that something confined to the Empire's end storyline? Is that, is that where that shows up or does that show up in Dark Empire 2? I don't really recall. Uh, I have it in front of me. I'm pretty sure the Galaxy Gun gets loaded up and fired in, uh, yeah, in Dark Empire 2. Yeah, because yeah. the end of Dark Empire 2, they basically blow up the New Republic, right? Yeah, uh, no, uh, they blow up their base. Uh, right, that, yeah, so, so that's what I mean. On the, yeah, I guess it is, yeah, that the majority of the New Republic is on, is on that base yeah. at that point. Because uh, the implication is that they killed Mon Mothma, they killed Akbar, and they killed, uh, like, all the rebel forces. I think there are a lot of interesting ideas, story-wise, in Dark Empire, but I have to be honest, and I don't know if this is just because of my difficulty engaging with the comics medium, but how would you summarize the story of Dark Empire? Like, sort of, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone else want to take this? <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot of stories going on. I mean, uh, I mean, I guess the the character pull story is that Luke Skywalker willingly gives himself to the dark side because he wants to figure out why his father fell to the dark side, and he does this in a way in which he doesn't involve his sister or anyone else or tell him that he's tell them that he's doing this, and when they try to pull him out of it, he pushes them away, and he does it so well that the Emperor doesn't detect that. Um, he is pulling a ruse on the emperor aside from filling around like why his father fell to the dark side and what's the lore of the dark side. He's also working as a double agent within the empire because the emperor, once he gets Luke Skywalker, I guess he's so happy. He finally achieved his goal from Jedi gives Luke like command status. And so Luke can feed things to the rebels and hint on them of what the empire is doing. Right. Um, at, at the same time you have, um, 
Han and Leia are trying to get to Luke, who is in the Empire, and they find themselves um, on a on. They, well, they go to Han's friends, right, Russ? They go to um, yeah, they're, Han's they're on friend. yeah. Now Hutta, um, so, Nahada, guess, yeah. uh, which is not like the, I guess the true homeworld of the Huts, but like a, a later adopted homeworld they took over and has like a Corellian sector. Yeah, and so they so they're on Nal Hutta. They're trying to figure out a way to infiltrate the Empire. Um, they're meeting up with Han Solo's old contacts there. During that time, their Boba Fett reemerges, and they're running from Boba Fett at that time. Um, Boba Fett doesn't have like a big part of the story, but he sort of just it's, it's just where I think the audience saying Boba Fett lived, he escaped. We right. don't know how. But he's causing more problems. He's a if he facilitates that antagonist role. It's like uh, everything's good uh, except until Boba Fett shows up. And actually, his entrance is kind of really fun because it's like a you know the robot's like broken. It's like a Mister Fett to see you. Or like you yeah. turn the page and you get like you know a nice like full body panel Boba Fett. And you're like, yeah, that's that's how you do it. Uh, that's so in my mind like this is this is the Boba Fett that I that I know and love. Uh, because like I know him more from the Dark Empire series than mm -hmm. you know than the movies. He has more to do here, um, but yeah, and he's just really that that returning intent. It's like every time you think you got rid of him, look who shows up, Boba Fett, and it's like it's great because that, that's kind of the best version of him. Little bits, little snippets, and he's always a pain in the ass. Like that's Boba Fett. I agree, and so he's a great. It's like I would say in this this issue, he's like sort of a cameo, not like fully used, but he's like I said. He helps the thrust star and you know antagonist forward, and then and Russ, correct me if I'm wrong. Ha, Luke, uh, I'm sorry, Han and Leia eventually reach Luke, and but Luke is um, ends up pushing them away and telling them to leave without him. You don't know what I'm doing here, and then we evolve into finding out that the Emperor has clones that he's been doing this all along. This is how he right. survived for a long time, and. Leia comes back into the story and then the Emperor realizes that he could set his sight on not just Luke Skywalker, but Leia and Leia's unborn child can also be one of his sights because yes. uh, he can have all of them as an apprentice. And then I think Leia tries to fight him with a broken lightsaber she got from an old Jedi Knight who... Oh, God, yes. what is her name? Her name uh, uh, is... Vima, uh, Vima. Vima, Vima yeah. yes. Yeah. So Vima, we don't know her story really, but she left the Jedi Order, was thrown out of it or something, and she, they meet on Nal Hatta, and she gives Leia a lightsaber that Leia then uses to try to fight the Emperor. Right. Um, something that I thought was pretty cool was um, the idea that the Jedi, I mean, once again, we really don't know anything about the Jedi at this point. We haven't seen the prequels, so they're still kind of very mysterious and i thought the way that they're discussed and referred to throughout dark empire manages to maintain a lot of that mystique even while we're learning more about them because again i think in dark empire 2 sort of luke's main preoccupation is going around the galaxy trying to uh, recover knowledge and relics and find force sensitive people to train to rebuild the jedi that that's in Dark Empire too, I believe, right? It's yeah, not so much Mon, in Dark Empire. Yeah. Mon Mothma sends him, says that we need the Jedi Order back to defeat the Empire. So that's right, his right. his top priority is to do that. Luke wants to take a slow approach, but everyone else really wants to attack head on. So he kind of gets sidelined, which you know, like he was leading, you know, the fleet before that. You know, in our experience watching the films, and now he's kind of getting sidelined. It's like, no, it's better you go restart the Jedi. So he kind of kind of gets gets put on the back burner a little bit well that which is interesting. happens no well that actually kind of happens though in the movies like after the battle of hoth he takes a different role for sure yeah yeah like i mean when he shows up they still let him in when he rings the doorbell but like the briefing room scene in return of the jedi like he's not there and then all of a sudden he's just like yeah no i'm with you too and it's like where the hell did you come from <laughs> i mean i think uh luke's lucas sort of at that point is like oh there's a jedi back we don't really know what that is but it's very important so he can do whatever he wants like he's he's right you know, he's like if the master master skywalker says something we're gonna do it i do believe this is the first appearance of the jedi holocron is that a creation of dark empire Yes, yes. Yeah. I, be I believe yeah. so specifically, uh, yeah. which like that still exists to this day. I mean, like if you go to Galaxy's Edge, the theme park, like they have they have holocrons there. So, I mean, like this is something that's a part of Star Wars lore that has survived all of the regime changes and everything in the expanded universe. I mean, I think there's a lot in this book that carried on to every, aside the expanded universe, but into canon now. I mean... 
you know, I mean, not to, I don't want to ruffle that, but you know, the the rise of Skywalker's ending with the return of the emperor comes from this book, whether or not they want to admit it. And he comes back the same way in, in that last movie that he comes back in this, in this, in this book. So his whole end game in rise of Skywalker of basically transferring his essence into Ray is sort of his plan here with the, um, uh, what is his name in this? Anakin Organa Solo? Is that Anakin, the name yeah. of Anakin. their third? Yeah. There's a lot lifted from Dark Empire. But not potentially lifted, but a lot of ideas that ma that do match. For sure. I mean, those two in particular, and also this idea of exploring Leia's force powers and her relationship to Jedi and Jedi training, which obviously in the sequel trilogy was somewhat complicated, obviously, by the loss of Carrie Fisher. But they still managed to go out of their way to show that she was at one point training as a Jedi. We get to see her holding a lightsaber and fighting with a lightsaber in the movie. So, so that's... That's certainly a part of this. And also, you know, just the very notion that the future of this story deals with the choices that Han and Leia's children will make as the next generation of Skywalkers. Like toward the end of the Dark Empire saga or stories or whatever you want to call it, you know, there's a lot of emphasis about uh, protecting Han and Leia's children, in particular, the Anakin child the idea that if he falls to the dark side or if he falls under the influence of the emperor it's really bad news for the galaxy um you know which is something i guess you could draw a parallel between that and what happens with ben solo slash kylo ren in the sequels which is a really good point that basically uh i think one of the major ideas of the dark empire story is that uh we're going to be fighting an endless war until we have jedi to end this like is really kind of one of the, the major thoughts in this book um and i think like luke uh realizing like i need to learn the dark side in order to i think he realizes because he doesn't know what jedis had come before you know they we only know them kind of as warrior monks or maybe like knights templar um i think he because he doesn't know what came before he has no real history to draw from well maybe now at the holocron uh he's going to learn everything he can by whatever means he can and there's a point and th this is um one of my favorite parts where they're they're talking to luke um they just rescued him uh from bis and they're on the millennium falcon and he's like uh what are you talking about he's like i need to continue fighting and he's like uh it's very simple you know i'm still on bis uh so he is force projecting um and oh, like, yes. it, it, it blew my mind because this comic was showing force powers that we hadn't seen in the films and I was just like, that is why. And it's like, I'm using a dark side power to do this. Uh, and I was like, to me, that was both creative and like, it kind of blew my mind at the time. And of course we see that in a major way, uh, spoilers in, um, uh, the, uh, the last Jedi. Um, yeah. So it's, it's really cool because that to me is some of like the best parts, like some really nuanced bits of, uh, Tom Veach's interpretation of what Jedi can be, where again, like Timothy Zahn had kind of different take on that altogether. And I think Veach is more curious about exploring it, exploring the Jedi, the history, kind of what they mean. Um, and that's really a lot of, yeah, a lot of Luke's role in this book is, is kind of facilitating that story along with Leia, who, you know, they, they team up together, um, ultimately to what i find is kind of a, a little bit of an underwhelming end. like the, the actual clone lightsaber fight with luke is pretty impressive in this in the story but the actual very kind of um i would say like secondary ending seems a little bit underwhelming to me in the first part um i, I find the action in dark empire 2 to be some people found it repetitive um in some of the like the older message boards i was reading through um i happen to like dark empire 2 a little bit more because you've already kind of yeah you've already kind of built the world i see it as i see it as maybe diminishing returns i think the sales of dark empire 2 did not do as well and they canceled a potentially future uh, miniseries after that um from what i what i believe I, I read through um and i think some people didn't necessarily like the kind of like um electro steampunk kind of thing that happens and part of it but uh for me what's really exciting is um uh the point in where um, they're on a osis um the uh the old jedi planet um and they they actually find uh natives to the planet who might have been descendants of jedi and it kind of feels like a very kind of fantastic great evolution of like a star wars adventure story of like going out to find 
someone who you're looking for and then encountering them and then kind of, you know, or put the team together. Um, it's kind of a fun uh, mm. moment for me. No, and you know, something you just made me think of is that um, if you listen to Gary Kurtz, what he recounts from what the plan was after The Empire Strikes Back for future Star Wars and for the sequel trilogy, the whole idea of the other as Luke's sister was that was a character that was not supposed to be Leia, but that you would meet later on in the sequel trilogy, Luke would sort of be on a mission to find her. The idea was sort of that Luke and his sister were separated at opposite ends of the galaxy to basically protect them, which which, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense. So but that's actually that's actually an interesting, um, probably unintentional parallel. The idea that sort of Luke is on a mission to recover Jedi and kind of find old Jedi and their descendants. I think that's interesting. Um, just going back to what you were saying, Russ, I think you're right that the core idea here is that to end the war, you need to not just rebuild the Jedi, but find some kind of way to integrate the dark side. Tom Veach has a quote in one of the Star Wars Insider articles. One of the documents he wrote to Lucasfilm to sort of explain what he had in mind for this was, and I'm quoting here, most importantly, he argued that Luke could learn about the dark side without being devoured the secrets of the dark side must be assimilated in order for the dark side to finally be conquered. Otherwise, there is only endless combat and endless war. Here we are working with the principle that's described in Jungian psychology as the integration of the shadow. See into your enemy and learn finally that he has an aspect of yourself. This simple idea is the key to what I'm trying to do. It's there in the films and the relationship of Luke and his father. And ultimately, it must be shown to be true in Luke's relationship to the Emperor and to the dark side. So I think you're exactly right. Like the idea is Luke is essentially saying, OK, the the only way to end this conflict is to not fear the dark side, but sort of figure out how to reintegrate it into yourself. It's that unification principle, like to, to bring like, yeah. the light and dark together. And really, that that's kind of where The Last Jedi was kind of going, but it really doesn't. I mean, the, the Jedi, the time of the Jedi are over, it, it kind of goes in a different direction than I think would be like my well, preference so, would be this, but they're starting yeah, on that well, path. Yeah. Well, so, so the interesting thing that you bring up is that in the movie, The Last Jedi, it's dealing with a similar idea that the dark side has to be integrated somehow. But the one who realizes that at least initially is not Luke. He gets there, but it's sort of the the experience that he goes through in the movie and the example of seeing Ray and also the discussion he has with Yoda where he gets there, you know, and I think for me, like that to me is a little more interesting and a little more satisfying than like as much as I think that there are a lot of great ideas in Dark Empire. For me, I kind of miss the Luke Skywalker from the original trilogy. Like the Luke in this, the Luke in Dark Empire, he's a Jedi master. And to me, he's he's very aloof. You know, he's not very relatable at all, you know, which is not helped by the fact that a lot of the story of Dark Empire is like his motivations are intentionally opaque because he's sort of undercover, for lack of a better term, you know, which makes sense. Uh, but that comes at, the price of at least for me you sort of lose your connection with him as a character i don't know how you guys feel about that um you know i, I have to say like the the depiction of luke in this thing is sort of the depiction i've had in luke in my head for a long time like sure this, yeah no this is this no, is which the i luke, get like this is my like you know like this is my version of luke skywalker that i lived with for a long time and the way they depicted him like wearing his a version of his father's sort of suit and because that's how he was after dark empire that's how he was depicted a lot even on other book covers and other comic books like that was his costume so this is sort of like my version of luke and um i'm i'm okay with it um you know i i get what you could say like he's distant and aloof but since in my head, a lot of the expanded universe merges, like I know in other books and other comics, he's not like this. So I, I know we're talking about right. specifically the Stark Empire. And yes, I agree with you, but I didn't rub up against it, I guess, because like by the time I was reading Dark Empire, I was reading everything else that they were putting out for new Star Wars. So mm -hmm. Luke isn't always like this in my mind. But I can tell, but I can see in the story, he's, he doesn't want a connection like with the audience or even the characters in the story sometimes. He's trying to be undercover. So, right. Yeah. Oh, totally. And I will say, 
in Dark Empire 2, when they find that the, the two younger um, uh, natives to Osis who are possibly Jedi descendants and two of the, the brother and sister, uh, particularly Jem, who he has that, that, um, that Jedi connection with and is able to understand their language. Uh, and then he's quickly falling uh, in love with her. And, and Luke actually gets to have this kind of, uh, I guess, to have a romance. And I think there's a point where they say, like, you know, I've been fighting wars and I haven't had time for myself or for love. And um, it's it's funny, too, because in Luke's uh, Jedi world, it seems like uh, we know for the prequels that, you know, forbidden to have a, a lover uh, in the Jedi. But this is before that. And uh, Luke falls in love and it seems very natural. And I'm like, ah, oh, he really needs this. Good for him. Like, <laughs> like I just I just no, want sure. him to have yeah. want him to have some like some emotional peace where it's like his much of his like adult life has just been battles, um, parental issues. Uh, you know, he's, he's had like a real rough go of it and to have him have that connection, which is, uh, you know, spoiler, really heartbreaking, um, end for, for, is it Jem? I think. Yeah. Um, and just like yeah. that kind of yeah, broke my heart. Cause it's like, I want him to have it, but I get it for star Wars to work in a serialized manner and to have other books and characters, you kind of have to, um, cartoon episode, this thing where, uh, the next episode uh, is a reset and everyone's wearing the same clothes and, and there's no permanent damage to any of the characters. So the next storyteller kind of take over and, and write that next piece of the story. Um, but I do feel like that was the only point because he is very dark. He's very solemn. He's withdrawn and he's hard to reach as, uh, as a reader. Uh, and then I think in two, he opens up and Cam Solsar, uh, the other, um, I don't know if I said that name, right. The other Jedi that he uh, encounters, uh, between the two books, uh, I think also helps him kind of open up a little bit. He has someone to talk to who's a fellow Jedi who he can actually communicate with. And I think that allows the audience in a little bit more to his mindset. So between, uh, uh, um, that character and Jem um, is helpful for us as an audience to kind of, it makes up for a little bit of that, that, that distance in the first book. I mean, that's a good point that, that I had forgotten about that. Um, just real quick. The other Jedi character I really liked was the King of that planet. He sort of has no <laughs> limbs and like, he, he kind of is yes. like, yeah, is like half man, half like repulsor lift. Um, <laughs> I thought that that was a cool concept for a character that like on his planet, he's a King, but also he was a Jedi. And now that the Jedi are around again, he's like, Oh shit. Like I gotta go be a Jedi. Like, you know, fuck this King shit. Uh, <laughs> the hierarchy. Thought, it's a like King. Yeah. Jedi is <laughs> yeah. I thought, <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool, but um... I mean, I think right now in the Dark Em, if we were like looking at the Dark Empire as alone or the Dark Empire too, like the Jedi were never cooler than they were right then in that moment where they were sort of just they were they were mage knights, they were magical knights. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's something that really comes across in this. They really do, like I said, they preserve the mystique of the Jedi. Like you don't, you still don't really know what they were like. You're still sort of getting like drips and trickles of Jedi things. And you still get the sense that the totality of them was sort of unknowable, um, which in the prequels, the prequel movies, like seeing the 12 of them in that, you know, little council and seeing how bureaucratic they were and how s sort of confined it felt like it made them feel very you know, small and less exciting and less mythic, which I think may have been at least partially intentional or at least certainly works with the knowledge of, you know, what's going on in the galaxy and like how they're on the precipice of a fall. So, I mean, that like sort of makes sense. Uh, but I don't think that that rendition of them is really as exciting or as fascinating as it's sort of even though we're learning more about them they're still mysterious and can be sort of anything here that's a great point where it's like they become so bureaucratic that they kind of maybe have lost sight they become so so strict in their in their ways that they kind of lost sight about like what the, what the great ancient jedi civilization they've been so far removed yeah. from it maybe due to like battles, loss of knowledge. And I think this is something that mirrors a lot of civilizations in history where you kind of lose a part of the past and it's just like forgotten knowledge. And you're just, it's almost like a, like a cultural amnesia. Uh, and so that's kind of where the Jedis are picking up from and have kind of lost a sense of yeah. their purpose, what they were. And that's why they were so easily tricked because they hadn't dealt with the, the dark side in who knows how many years. And so they didn't see it coming because they didn't have the history of battling um, the Sith and having the ability to understand or see it or know these kind of tricks. So I feel like uh, 
Uh, that's a, that's probably the best explanation. The prequels work really well with Dark Empire because you see you, see, you, have, you have people who don't know what the Jedi were like. They never met any of them. It's uh, it's very interesting. Well, that's certainly very true. Like like I think that Dark Empire surprisingly still works very well with the prequel films. It still more or less works almost unchanged. It's my Star Wars sequel. I mean, I, I consider this um, the actual uh, uh, sequel to uh, Return of the Jedi. So it works for me. Uh, everything is so good. I mean, I've said I'm with you, Russ. I mean, I've said that uh, my my I mean, I'm, I'm, my preferred universe is the expanded universe. If I have to live live in one, but you know, since we, yeah. since we get to choose, I guess I, I can pick and choose what I like. But I like the expanded universe. I'm with you. And I and I'm a Veach guy. I'm a Veach guy. I'm not a I'm not a Zon guy. I mean, I it's it's cool. They're good. I like I like the Veach uh, philosophy a little bit more. I think I do as well. I haven't um, been able to completely fully revisit the Zon trilogy, but that's something that's on my to do list. Um, any closing thoughts? What do you think is the legacy of Dark Empire? You know, I mean, I think you know, like we kind of discussed. I mean, I think it's while it's not canon anymore, lots of writers either directly or maybe. Just because it's been around for so long, the expanded universe have taken it and put it in the current day Star Wars property. So I think like the Dark Empire established a lot of stuff that we don't see it in the form of what Dark Empire was, but we see it manifest in other ways as our this new Star Wars universe is, is unfolding. Yeah, and I guess I guess what I could say is about Empire's End uh, as a wrap up, uh, we talked about it not really kind of matching necessarily. It was kind of designed to mimic um, and kind of conclude that the story that Veach has started that he didn't get to finish. What I would say is uh, to any listener or watcher um, to pick up um, uh, the Star Wars Boba Fett Death Lies and Treachery where um, Cam Kennedy art uh, continues. And so it kind of feels like um, kind of the spiritual uh, successor to um, the Dark Empire books, you can still kind of get the flavor and style and you're getting that kind of more of that universe, even though it's a different writer, um, it still kind of keeps you in that headspace. Um, they have the collected edition hardcover book, um, but on, on eBay, you can still kind of in, in some select, you know, used bookstores, you could find the, the full size Dark Horse editions. And I would just say, you know, get the larger editions if you can. It's nice to be able to read comics at their close to the original size or larger, uh, just kind of uh, better to engage with. And it just feels uh, it's like a better, uh, better reading experience, a bigger book in your hand. Oh, I have those in um, a box in my childhood bedroom somewhere that I'm now very interested because I never made the connection that the Cam Kennedy are continued on in those. And now having revisited Dark Empire and really having a new appreciation for his artwork, I'm now really interested in going to revisit those books. I would say swipe them up if you find them, because now that the rights went back to Marvel and Disney, some of the Dark Horse stuff may be out of print. It may never come back into print. You may have to wait for reprinting. So get your physical copies when you can. Yes, I think in light of recent events, I think it's just further evidence that stuff does not last forever in digital form on the Internet. So uh, it's another reason to hold on to your physical media. Um, but I really enjoyed this discussion and, uh, Russ, it was your passion and enthusiasm for Dark Empire in particular that made me go back and reread it. And I'm really glad that I did because I had a lot of fun spending time with it. And it actually really brought back a lot of memories of those halcyon days in mint condition, uh, James, <laughs> the comic shop, which now lives on in virtual podcast form on the secret origins of mint condition podcasts that you do, which I, I occasionally stop by in and contribute You're to the conversation every once in a while. Frequent customer and contributor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to thank Russ and James for a great discussion, and I hope we can revisit some of these 90s era expanded universe things together again in the future. If you like what you heard, please visit TrashComPod.com, where we have transcripts of this episode and all of our other episodes, and we are TrashComPod across all social media. Please, if you're so inclined, take the time to rate and review the show. It really does help us out, and we will see you on the next one. Okay.